All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Clay, for that very nice introduction. And thank all of you for coming today. It is a pleasure to be here and a really wonderful opportunity to get to talk to you about a topic close to my head as well as my heart and also to introduce some of the ideas from a new book that I've published, which probably won't be of particular interest to most of you because you already know enough about Taiwan that this book is uh, not going to bring you too much new information, um, but might be of interest to some of the people around you who ask you maybe questions about why Taiwan is important, why you care about Taiwan, um, why it's one of the things that would motivate you to come out on a beautiful afternoon and sit inside for an hour or more listening to a speaker. So the title of my book is Why Taiwan Matters, and obviously it begins with the assumption that Taiwan does matter. And so to begin with, let me just situate us. Where is Taiwan? Well, you all of you know it's on the, uh, south, off the south, southern coast of mainland China. And initially, and for a long time, in the Western imagination, the Western view of Taiwan centered on it as Formosa. The original European name for Taiwan was Formosa from Ilha Formosa in Portuguese, beautiful island. But in recent decades, Taiwan has become less and less of a beautiful island and more and more of a problem in international relations. Uh, for a while, we thought of Taiwan as Formosa, then as Free China, but now increasingly, Taiwan is talked about as a problem. What is the Taiwan problem and where does it come from? I think the easiest way to understand Taiwan as a problem, or the origins of Taiwan as a, as a problem in international relations, is to think of it as a place that was caught up in the Chinese Civil War in the mid-20th century. And since the Chinese Civil War has been a kind of disputed territory between the two sides in that conflict, I don't think that the role of Taiwan as a disputed territory between two Chinese governments exhausts the topic of Taiwan's identity or importance, but certainly characterizing Taiwan as a problem in international relations begins with the assumption that what matters about Taiwan is its role in this conflict between the nationalist KMT claimant to Chinese sovereignty and the communist or uh, PRC claim to Chinese sovereignty. So what is the PRC's position in this unresolved conflict over Taiwan? Well, it has evolved over time. Back in the Mao era, the PRC's position was that Taiwan needed to be liberated and brought under the PRC government forcibly, if necessary. But after the, uh, after the transition from the Mao era to the Deng era, the PRC position changed from liberation to the idea or the objective of peaceful unification. And in the most recent years in this relationship, we have intimations, hints from mainland China, that there may even be a further evolution in progress toward some other formulation of Taiwan's relationship to China or China's aspiration for Taiwan. But though that further development, the, the content of what might lie beyond peaceful unification has never really been fully or authoritatively articulated by the Chinese leadership. So what does Taiwan want? In, if we view Taiwan as a problem between uh, two claimants in the Chinese Civil War, what is the Taiwanese position? Well, in the era of uh, Jiang Kai-shek, Jiang Jieshi, and Jiang Jingguo, the uh, objective for Taiwan was to recover the mainland. So if the mainland's goal is to liberate Taiwan, the uh, 
Taiwan, Taiwan government's goal was to liberate the mainland from communism. But in recent decades, especially in the 1990s, a new idea about what Taiwan might want became very prevalent and assertive, and that was the idea of Taiwan independence, right? The idea that Taiwan, if Taiwan and China were a married couple that had been separated since the 1940s, rather than trying to get back together, which is what both uh, Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek were seeking, the Taiwan independence camp suggested, you know, just finalize the divorce and get it over with. Today, I would argue, we have a further development, or we can see perhaps more clearly, a trend that has been in place for a long time, which is that, in fact, the dominant preference in Taiwan is not for unification or for independence. So neither for moving back in together or for finalizing the divorce, but maintaining the current state, which is political separation, but without the kind of formal trappings of independence that are so anathema to the Chinese leadership and also to many uh, PRC citizens. So today, I think Taiwan's position in this dispute is really preserve the status quo. That is the dominant preference in Taiwan. Of course, there is a third player in this relationship. It's not simply a bilateral relationship. The U.S. also has played and continues to play an important role. So it's worth asking, what's the U.S. position on the dispute between two claimants in the Chinese Civil War, one of which is increasingly uninterested in continuing um, to claim its status as a Chinese government? The U.S. position is summarized by the State Department by reference to three communiques, so three documents signed by the U.S. and uh, the PRC government and the Taiwan Relations Act, a, an act of uh, legislation by the U.S. Congress. And the, the sort of substance of these various documents is that whatever solution is achieved in the Taiwan Strait is acceptable to the U.S but the process by which that settlement is reached should be peaceful. So, for example, the Shanghai communique, the first of the three communiques signed in 1972, states the U.S. position on the relationship between Taiwan and China this way. The United States acknowledges that all Chinese maintain that there's one China and Taiwan is part of it, and the U.S. doesn't challenge that position. So the U.S. has never endorsed the idea of unification, nor has the U.S. ever endorsed the idea of independence. The U.S.'s position is that the Chinese in Taiwan and in mainland China believe there's one China and Taiwan is part of it, and it is not our role to offer an opinion or to dispute that position. But it is our role to affirm our interest in a peaceful settlement of this dispute. Furthermore, the Taiwan Relations Act, which is also one of the governing documents for U.S. policy, says that because peaceful resolution of this dispute is in the interest of the United States, anything that is unpeaceful, right, any coercive action, will require the U.S. to at least uh, be capable of responding. So again, the U.S., the TRA doesn't commit the U.S. to take one side or the other in a military conflict between Taiwan and the PRC, but it does acknowledge that the U.S. has an interest in such a conflict. President Bill Clinton added yet another dimension to the U.S. position on Taiwan PRC relations when he said that whatever settlement is achieved must be peaceful, but also must not be made over the opposition of Taiwan's people. So President Clinton was acknowledging the importance of democracy in the process of resolving the cross-strait differences. The result then, the sort of summation of all of these 
elements in U.S. policy is a policy that we call strategic ambiguity, that the U.S. has never committed itself to taking any particular substantive position on the how the conflict might be resolved. So the U.S. is not for independence. The U.S. is not for unification. The U.S. was for a peaceful settlement and reserves the right to take a variety of positions and to follow a variety of strategies depending upon the circumstances. So this is why the policy is called ambiguous. All right, so where does all of this leave us? We have uh, the PRC position favoring unification, Taiwan position favoring the status quo, U.S. position favoring peaceful resolution, but times are changing. We know that the context in which these events are unfolding is moving in very significant ways. Above all, China's economic, political, and military power are all clearly increasing. At the same time that the U.S. finds itself increasingly stretched and limited in its own ability to respond to global problems and global situations. On top of those factors and those environmental factors, today in 2011, it's fair to say, I think, that relations between Taiwan and the PRC are better than they have ever been in history. Since the founding of the PRC in 1949, the relationship between the two sides has never been as amicable, as mutual, as win-win as it is today. So therefore, one might ask the question, you know, why should the U.S., which is already stretched to the breaking point with other international commitments as well as domestic challenges, continue to support Taiwan in its efforts to resist unification on Beijing's terms? And the answer, I would argue, is because avoiding unification over the opposition of Taiwan's people is in the interest of the United States, it is the in, in the interest of Taiwan, and it is also in the interest of the PRC and China more broadly. So why does Taiwan matter? How can I make the case that it is in the interest of the United States and other international actors to help Taiwan preserve the current status quo? Well, I think Taiwan matters in a variety of ways, and I'm going to speak to each of these in a little more detail. First of all, Taiwan matters to the world as a, moder a model of successful economic and political development. Secondly, Taiwan matters to the U.S. as part of a larger geostrategic approach to the world that has been, for decades, very successful. And thirdly, Taiwan matters because resolving the Taiwan issue in a peaceful and mutually advantageous and acceptable way is of enormous importance to the PRC. If the PRC fails to accomplish this objective, it will pay a very high price. But finally, um, what I really want to uh, focus on most of all is that Taiwan matters to itself and to its own people. And it therefore deserves to be treated not only as an, a means to the ends that other nations seek, need, it deserves to be treated not only as something that is of interest to the U.S. or of interest to the PRC, it also deserves to be regarded as an end in itself. So how is Taiwan a model to the world? First of all, Taiwan's so-called miracle economy, right? The, amazing economic performance that Taiwan has achieved since the 1950s not only stands as an accomplishment on its own, but also illustrates to nations in the developing world the possibility of achieving rapid development with equity and fairness to all. Uh, one, uh, you know, this graph captures GDP per capita. What it doesn't show you is that Taiwan's rapidly rising GDP was distributed relatively evenly among its people so that the standard of living for nearly all Taiwanese was raised simultaneously. And the miracle economy today, as uh, uh, we were, as Clay was explaining earlier, talking about the, your, your 
iPhone, uh, the miracle economy today continues to serve not only the interests of, of people in Taiwan and in mainland China, but also all of us who have an interest in, you know, buying these things, um, these high-tech and low-tech goods at reasonable prices. So Taiwan's economy continues to provide an example of successful development both in the high-tech sector and then also as a particular kind of economic model using small and medium-sized enterprises to distribute the benefits of economic development widely in society. The second way in which Taiwan stands as a model to other nations is in its political development, its de democratic miracle, if you will. Uh, back in the days of uh, Chiang Kai-shek, here seated on his throne in the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial in downtown Taipei, the word democracy may be above his head, but there wasn't very much democracy under his reign. But over the decades between about 1975 and 1996, Taiwan democratized its political system with very little conflict, very little bloodshed, and a remarkable degree of stability in, in policy and, and political progress. So uh, this Chiang Kai-shek memorial was at one point in the mid-2000s taken over by a kind of civil society and transformed into a public, a truly public space uh, as a manifestation of the way in which the authoritarian weight of the Zhang era has lifted in Taiwan and, and been replaced by a very vibrant liberal democracy. From the U.S. standpoint, Taiwan matters because it is part of a global security architecture that has been very successful in preserving stability around the world in the second half of the 21st century. And of course, there has been lots of conflict in the 20, in the, uh, sorry, the second half of the 20th century. There's plenty of conflict, and the U.S. was a participant in much of it in the second half of the 20th century. And much of the conflict that the U.S. was involved in was, like the current conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, aimed at achieving precisely the kind of political and economic outcomes Taiwan has achieved peacefully and without conflict. So the U.S. has expended great blood and treasure trying to create Taiwans around the world, while Taiwan has created itself while accumulating treasure and with almost no expenditure of blood. So I think it's worth considering what would be lost if the model of Taiwan were to lose its power to influence others, and if the role that uh, the U.S. and its network of alliances has played in stabilizing the international environment were to be eroded. What does Taiwan have to do with the network of U.S. security alliances? Well. I think it's fair to at least suggest that were the U.S. to withdraw its defense assistance and security uh, relationship with Taiwan, that others in this network of alliance would begin to wonder about their own fate and their own future and the reliability of the U.S. as a partner for peace and defense. Also, Taiwan matters in terms of the international environment because Taiwan stands as a kind of canary in the coal mine for China's rise. We will be able to discern what kind of global power China is likely to be in part by how it manages difficult problems. And there, is, there are few problems for China, external problems, more difficult than Taiwan. Finally, I would argue that Taiwan matters to the PRC and to China, and we, I think, might usefully differentiate between those two things. Um, at least I think a lot of Chinese PRC folks would like us to differentiate. It matters to the PRC because a failed unification attempt would be a disaster for China. It would be a disaster for Taiwan, but it would also be a disaster for the PRC. And if we look at this public opinion information from Taiwan, what we can see is that 
while the moment for unification is not ripe, since only about 38% of Taiwanese are enthusiastic about the idea of unification, even if uh, the political, social, and economic conditions on both sides of the strait are the same, the possibility for unification is not completely foreclosed. Even if Taiwan could achieve independence without paying any cost from the PRC, only about 62% of Taiwanese circa 2008 said they would want, they would choose to pursue independence. So the situation in terms of Taiwan preferences is still in flux. And in fact, in 2008, about a quarter of Taiwanese, when asked, are you for independence if it could be done peacefully or unification under good conditions, said, yes, I am. Right? So I think the lesson for the PRC out of this data is that the time is not right for unification today, but the future is not yet decided. And patience, therefore, is a wise strategy, because to push for unification before the time is right will produce a backlash in Taiwan and a backlash in mainland China that could be highly destabilizing for, for the PRC government and would certainly be extremely damaging to the PRC's international position and reputation. But finally, I want to uh, spend some time thinking about Taiwan is an end in itself, and Taiwan having value in itself, because Taiwan, I think, ultimately matters to Taiwanese, and that is something that we ought to take into account. Why does Taiwan matter to itself? Why does Taiwan have an identity that the people who live there are eager to preserve? I think it has a lot to do with Taiwan's history, right? The first people to settle in Taiwan were not of Chinese origin, but of uh, Malayo-Polynesian origins. These are uh, folks of the Bunan community from about 1900. But the existence of an indigenous or aboriginal population in Taiwan before any Chinese, uh, ethnic Chinese people ever arrived there helps to, to give Taiwan a, f a historical and cultural foundation that, that differentiates it in meaningful ways from uh, mainland China. Then in the late 1500s and through the 1800s, a steady influx of, p of migrants from mainland Chinese began arriving in Taiwan. So that today, about 98% of the people living in Taiwan have their ancestry or their ancestral origins in mainland China. But in 1895, Taiwan was handed over by the Qing Dynasty to the Empire of Japan. And for 50 years, which it, at that time in human history was a, about two lifetimes, Taiwan was a colony of Japan. And that gives rise to the uh, odd phenomenon of the world's skinniest sumo wrestling team. <laughs> But in 1945, at the end of World War II, when Japan's uh, empire was dismantled, Taiwan was handed to the Republic of China as part of the post-war settlement, and for a brief time was governed from mainland China. The consequence of these waves of migration and periods of integration with main, the mainland and then separation from the mainland have given rise in Taiwan to a culture which is distinctive and unique. It is a culture that is certainly Chinese, but is also local and Taiwanese in significant ways. There are characteristics of Taiwanese culture that are unique to the island, but also a culture that is global in a way that also differentiates it from traditional Chinese culture or from contemporary PRC culture. And we can see this at the level of high culture, elite culture, uh, the probably the most important high culture 
export that Taiwan has brought to the world is the Cloudgate Dance Theater under the leadership of the brilliant choreographer Lin Huaimin. And Lin Huaimin is very explicit in arguing that the, the art form that he has created through his dance company is rooted in China. So for example, the uh, cursive series of performances use Chinese calligraphy as a, a vehicle for expression, but that this particular way of dancing and of, of expressing uh, the human condition and human experience could only be, is only possible emerging from Taiwan, that there is something specifically for Lin Huaimin, Taiwanese, about the art form that he is creating. But also, this art form speaks to global culture and, and the universal language, or the, at least the humanly universal language of modern dance. So at the level of high culture, across the board, we see Taiwan merging the, the local, the regional, and the global in a way that is unique. The same thing is true at the level of pop culture, right? Uh, I, I checked this morning on YouTube and uh, uh, Lotus Wong is up to 3.6 million hits now uh, with her song Bobi. Global in the sense that Bobi is a cover of a Korean pop song. Chinese in the sense that if you watch this video you'll see all kinds of uh, Chinese folk religious iconography that would be familiar to people in the mainland and would have been familiar to people in the mainland a hundred years ago but also specifically local uh, to the point where, unless you know Taiwanese, there is no way you can understand the lyrics of this song. Even if you have the, the Chinese characters written down for you, this is a song that is in language, specifically Taiwanese, and in theme and format, very much a product of the Taiwanese experience over history, over time, and in the modern world. So whether we are talking about high culture or pop culture, Taiwan does have this unique identity that differentiates it from the mainland, differentiates it from other uh, places in the region, and I think is worthy of our respect and regard. So in conclusion, there's no question that cross-strait relations, the relationship between the PRC and Taiwan are incredibly strong. The amount of trade and investment is hard to uh, overstate. The amount of human interaction across the Taiwan Strait is hard to overstate. But for Taiwanese, the island of Taiwan and the society, culture, polity that they have established there is still at the heart of their experience and is still ultimately their first priority. So this is the uh, web page of the Mainland Affairs Council. And it tells us, you know, open the big door, go to the big land, or open the main door, go to the mainland. Why? In order to make Taiwan its its own master, or in order to put Taiwan first to benefit the people of Taiwan and to reinforce the idea that interaction with the mainland is about benefiting the people of Taiwan, we see the door is open, Mandai Kai, and the door guard says, Wang Gou Tzu, right? We are guarding the door. And he speaks in Taiwanese, again, a phrase that's not in, really intelligible in Mandarin but makes sense to a Taiwanese speaker. So yes, cross-strait relations are incredibly important and incredibly positive and warm at the, motion, at the moment, but for the people of Taiwan, the heart of their experience is their own homeland, the island of Taiwan. So for example, the Mainland Affairs Council chairwoman, Lai Xingwen, uh, says, the future development of cross-strait relations must respect the autonomous volition of the Taiwan people. The 23 million citizens of Taiwan certainly have the wisdom to choose a course that is most beneficial to Taiwan. So after a century when Taiwan's back was turned to the West, looking away from China toward 
first Japan in the north and then to the U.S., across the Pacific to the U.S. in the east. Taiwan is once again facing west toward the mainland. This is the mouth of Kaohsiung Harbor overlooking, the lighthouse overlooks the Taiwan Strait. The ships are sailing off to ports in mainland China. Uh, so Taiwan is certainly facing west for the first time in a century today. And the possibilities, therefore, for continued positive interactions between Taiwan and the PRC are many. But reaching a, an outcome in this relationship that serves the interests of all parties and meets the needs of the Taiwan people as well as the people of mainland China, I think, requires that we recognize that Taiwan does matter. And with that, I will conclude and invite your questions.